uh, the first thing that I want to say about stellar classification is just that the, um, the classification was built kind of in a historical way. And um, the classification has a number of different trends uh, that go along with different star properties. But it was built with only one piece of information in mind. So this is my poll question for you based on the reading. Um, stars are classified according to what? Uh, their temperature, magnitude, spectral appearance, atomic composition, or distance from Earth. Multiple of these things might be correlated with that stellar classification, but only one is actually used to do the classifying. Okay, so nobody said apparent magnitude and nobody said distance from Earth, which is good because those are extrinsic properties of stars. Those depend on our view as an observer. Um, so the stellar classification system correlates to temperature, but it's not made solely based on temperature. Um, and it, in fact, doesn't correlate to atomic composition in the way you think. So uh, the stellar classification system was based solely on spectral appearance. Okay, we do know that it correlates to stellar temperature. So again, a poll just to um, test your reading recall, I guess, the, which way demonstrates the highest uh, temperature. So the head of the air would be at the highest temperature. Okay, I see most votes for A, that the temperature is highest for the O-type stars and coolest for the M-type stars. That's exactly right. So the full set of classes is O, B, A, F, G, K, M for the stars. And then there's three more classes, L, T, and Y, but those are not stars. They're sort of objects that could have been stars, but they weren't massive enough to actually become stars. These are called brown dwarfs. So there's three spectral classes for brown dwarfs. But we'll mostly consider O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And there's you know lots of mnemonics that you might feel like using to uh, keep track of these. Um, I like this one. Your textbook has a couple that I think are not really fabulous, but um, this one honors the uh, person who developed the classification system, Annie Jump Cannon, by saying, our brilliant Annie found grouping by Kelvin meaningful. This is something a student from last year made up. Uh, I guess she didn't really group by Kelvin because, like I just said, she was grouping based on the appearance of stellar spectra. Nevertheless, it turns out that the classification system is according to temperature. Okay, so how do we classify stars based on their spectra? Well, let's look at a star spectrum and see what we notice, right? So if this was your job, if all these different rows each represent a different class of star, and you had to classify the stars, uh, where would you start? Maybe you'd say, okay, it looks like there are some you know, strong absorption features, some strong dark bands that occur at specific wavelengths, and so I'm going to classify the stars based on the strength of those absorption features. And that's exactly um, what Annie Jump Cannon did. Uh, the original system went A, B, C, D, et cetera, based on, I think, the hydrogen alpha line, but then that was reformulated based on different lines by Annie Jump Cannon later in a way that did correspond to the temperature of the stars. This is, uh, let's see, one O-type spectra, and then we have uh, two B, two A, and then two more of each F, G, K, and M. And the, something you might notice is that actually there's a lot of similarities between spectra across different stars, right? There's a blue line that's shared between the B-type stars, the A-type stars, and the F-type stars. That blue-green line is also similar for many of them. The red line is similar for many of them. Um, and the stars in general have largely the same composition. So all stars are made primarily of hydrogen and helium. And with a smattering of heavier elements, most of those elements, the heavy elements, were produced in supernova explosions from previous generations of stars. So when we look at these different stellar spectra, they're not necessarily telling us that the stars have different compositions, but they are telling us um, whether the light, the photons that are being generated uh, inside the star, are of the correct energy to excite the atoms that are in the star. So what do I mean by that? If I have an O-type star, then it's too hot for hydrogen to exist in its neutral state. There's only ionized hydrogen. And so you don't get strong hydrogen lines because there's no electrons in the atom to absorb uh, the light. Um, but if we go to the coolest stars, then it's actually the, the stars are too cool to produce the energies of photons needed to excite the hydrogen. And so we don't get strong hydrogen lines down there either. So we get the hot, strongest hydrogen lines for stars that are at intermediate temperatures, the A, F, and G type. And so it's a bit complicated, and I don't expect you to remember all the rules, but you can find tables that lay out like this uh, what the most strong lines for each of the stellar classes is. The other thing I want to point out about this system is that um, there are these subdivisions for each class, zero through nine. And so zero is the hottest class or star in each subclass, and then nine is the coolest star for each subclass. So for example, O9 is just a little warmer than B0, which is warmer than B5, which is warmer than B9, and et cetera. So um, when we look at different stars, we can tell their temperature based on their color, and then we can you know, figure out which uh, class they might be in based on that as well. So here's my question for you, a little bit of review. Uh, which of these stars is hotter, Antares or Spica? All right, I see the most votes for B, that Spica is the hottest star. And that's exactly right. Our blue stars are hotter than the red stars. And we know that the uh, classification system increases in temperature as we go toward the O class. We could map on a, a color map for stars onto this axis as well. And um, by looking at this, we would say Spica must be probably an O, B, or an A type star, whereas Antares is you know, kind of an orangish red star, so maybe that's a K type or an M type star. And it turns out that indeed Spica is a B1, and Antares is an M1. All right, so when we see that you know, um, our sun, for example, is a G1V star, it means that our sun is a G-type star of subclass 1, and that it has a luminosity class, which we'll talk about later, of V, which just means it's a normal star.